he is said to be the father of <coughs> modern aseptic or antiseptic surgery. He actually said, without Semmelweis, my achievements will be nothing. To this great son of Hungary, surgery owes most. And he used not only the technique of, of washing hands and so on, but when Lister was operating, he had a very fine spray of phenol. And it didn't help in some respects. It, it would be unpleasant. But it stopped the wound becoming infected after the surgery had finished. Today we do the same thing by sterilizing the air before it gets into the operating theater. And so there are no germs in the air. But in those days they couldn't do this. But the principle is the same. And uh, Lister was able to get very high success with his surgery. Very few of his patients uh, ended up with septic wounds. And just in passing, when I uh, worked um, a while back, one of our staff was our chief medical officer and he said in his student days, there was a surgeon in uh, uh, Edinburgh where he, 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 he learned his uh, uh, medical, where had his medical training. And the affectionate name of the surgeon was Septic Sam. Can you believe that? <laughs> because he was so careless about hygiene and so many of his patients ended up with infected wounds. Well, we must move on. The Victorians are the saying that cleanliness is next to godliness. And, you know, that's very important. Back in the uh, Victorian times, Certainly in, in, in Europe, and particularly in Britain, because I can speak for that, they made sure that there was a clean water supply and they built large amounts of sewers and treatment works to deal with human waste. And they built public wash houses and public baths to cater for those who had neither of these facilities in their homes. And so people who hadn't got a bathroom could go and take a bath in, in, in these, these public baths got lots of little bathrooms and they went and paid a small amount. And similarly, there were public wash houses where there was good supply of hot water and detergents so they could wash their clothes and dry them if they hadn't got a facility at home. Now, this is Victorian times, and yet three and a half thousand years ago, in the law of Moses, there was this endless rep repetition of the need where there was a possibility of infection, wash your clothes and bathe. And, of course, uh, personal hygiene is actually uh, quite a recent phenomenon. We, we perhaps take it for granted now, but it is relatively recent. Um, many people didn't have adequate facilities in towns and cities. Uh, personal hygiene, I say, is relatively recent. It's said that uh, Queen Elizabeth I used to take a bath once a year when she didn't need one. Can you imagine that? Uh, and children were sometimes um, sewn into their clothes in, in the autumn and weren't unpicked till the spring. They wore the same clothes all winter. No wonder in those days Elizabethans used to carry these nosegays in a nice smell because the amount of B.O. In, in the population must have been phenomenal. They just didn't understand. But that wasn't a Jewish problem. Uh, they uh, were able, of course, for, because of the law of Moses and, and they followed this to, to wash and so on. Now the next thing I want to talk about not just personal hygiene, but actually infectious diseases. Now this is from Leviticus 13. Now, by the way, if you want to scratch, if you itch, I don't mind. Uh, often when you mention these things, people will suddenly feel <laughs> more trouble. But what I want to stress here is that here's the law about infectious skin disease. And the law said that if someone had this, they could go to the priest, um, a, 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 or one of his sons, and they would have been trained in order to recognize whether this was just some mild complaint or a serious infectious skin disease. Now there are you know, rules there, I won't go through them as how to tell, but the thing that's very important is the last line of, of the fourth verse. If the priest thought that this was a potentially infectious disease, then people were to be put in isolation for seven days, what we call today quarantine. Keep them away from everyone else so that the disease doesn't spread to others. And the reason we call it quarantine is the Italian word for forte, quaranta. Because in ancient times, when a ship came into port or near port with disease on board, they used to run up a, a particular flag, I think it was called the Yellow Duster, and said, in effect, we've got disease on board. And they remained offshore for 40 days. And the idea was, of course, that by that time, everyone had got better again, or suddenly everyone would, would have died. But you see, if the six sailors came to the port and then went all uh, over back to their own families, this disease could spread rapidly throughout the whole population. 
And it's not very long ago, certainly in Britain, we used to have isolation hospitals where children with certain infectious diseases, such as scarlet fever, were taken to isolate them from the um, community at large. Now, today, of course, we've got much better ways of treating some of these diseases. But there are diseases today for which we have no treatment and no cure. Uh, for example, Lassa fever and viral hepatitis. And the only way we can prevent it spreading in the population is to isolate these people. And, of course, those who nurse them uh, are at great risk of becoming infected themselves, and so they have to uh, take very careful precautions. Well, uh, this goes on about uh, checked again after seven days. If it's still uh, that he hasn't got better, then he is to be kept in isolation another seven days. And so it goes on. And if eventually the person, of course, uh, does not recover, then they are always potentially infectious so long as they have this disease. And, and so they are excluded from the community. They have to live apart. And I wonder whether you know, this is something that uh, we, we, we haven't actually always appreciated what this says. Because it goes on, the person with an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. Is this the first instance of a surgical mask? You, know, you see people, in, particularly in the Far East, if they've got a cold, they wear a mask so they don't spread it to other people. If there are a lot of colds about, again, you, even if you haven't got one, you wear a mask so you don't catch it from someone else. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then the rule is here that if, in fact, he continues to be infected, then he must live alone. He must keep away from other people so the disease isn't spread. And so these two measures, isolation in order to prevent the spread of the disease, and the lower part of the face is to be covered. Well, do you remember the epidemic a while back of uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, affectionately called SARS? Well, here's a picture uh, of two people who were, uh, were, were wearing masks in the Far East in order not to catch the disease, or if they got it, in order to prevent it's being spread, and everyone, almost everyone, uh, wore face masks. And even today, that, that goes on. Well, now, I want to talk about uh, the importance of uh, sanitation for public health. We mentioned earlier that it was the Victorians who understood the importance of uh, public health. They built sewers and so on, and treated sewage. But before that, people didn't understand how many diseases were waterborne, carried by water that was contaminated. Uh, in fact, uh, once they thought it was just the bad air from ditches and, and, and ponds and lakes, and that's where malaria comes from. They realized it was you know, linked in some way with water, because now we know it's the mosquito that carries malaria, that breeds in the, in the water. But in those days, they thought it was bad air, malaria. Uh, and of course, sanitation is a key factor in the maintenance of public health. And so, Human waste had to be disposed of outside the camp. Now, of course, th this is what we call the dry disposal method. It is, in effect, a latrine. And while Israel was moving, of course, uh, this was a very good way of stopping water becoming contaminated by human waste. And this really, uh, you know, contrasts with the medieval Europe, where chamber pots were usually emptied out of the window, often on the second or third uh, story. And if people were considerate, they might just shout something like, God, you know, meaning look out below. And that's one of the reasons why I have a habit which I can't kick. It comes from this time. It's no longer necessary, but when I was a young man, I was taught that when you were accompanying a lady, your mother, your girlfriend, colleague at work, you walked on the outside of the sidewalk. And I can't walk today on the inside if I'm accompanying a lady. I have to walk on the outside. And, and this is because, of course, in those days, the person who would uh, receive the contents of the chamber pot would be the gentleman. And the lady, usually walking on the overhang, as often the buildings went out at the first story and again the second story, uh, she would be safe and the gentleman would suffer. 